As with all these recordings, there should be a, a PDF of the presentation notes in the description link below. I'm going to talk about ethics, legislation, and their relationship to a particular part of public service in the British Isles social work practice. Before I get into it, I just want to quickly think about this, this joke cartoony thing um, and why I've included it. I think it's a good joke, but also it summarises a problem that there is in our understanding of the relationship between legislation and ethics. So that there's a, a common or a popular understanding that there's a fundamental contradiction. <clears throat> such that we've got the independent, plucky little public servant and the hideous, gargantuan legal system. And the, the plucky individual per public servant knows what the right thing to do is. They have a proper ethical sense of how they should behave. But the legal system is asking them or directing them to do something very different. And the problem with that as an idea is that um, not that there aren't occasions when law and ethics come into contradiction with one another, but I think it fundamentally misunderstands what, why we have systems that guide our behaviour rather than trusting our own personal judgments. And I, I hope that that's something I'll be able to bring out in the presentation. So these are the different things that contribute to our practice. I'm going to focus on the stuff with the green arrows to begin with, which is legislation and regulation. So legislation is supposed to give us a sense of direction that so our practice meets the intentions of the policy. So, and I mean here national level policy, the, the policy that the state has adopted through its democratic institutions in our society, but whatever institution. So we voted a bunch of political leaders in, they set a particular direction for welfare or public service, and we are then supposed to practice in line with that direction. Those policy intentions get written into law in order to direct our behaviour. So legislation in our society comes from primarily from Parliament. There are a bunch of other legislative bodies within our state, most importantly perhaps the House of Lords or the Second Chamber, um, but, but there are others as well. But we tend to focus on statute law from Parliament, things like the Children's Act and the Mental Health Act. When we do that though, we, we obscure or we ignore the fact that they, the British system in particular has a bunch of different legal sources. So. Because we don't have a formally uniform code of constitution, we, we don't have a particularly explicit description of what our state is like and what its parts are made up of and the relationship of the individual to the state, like a Bill of Rights. We have um, a long-standing historical record of a number of different things, some of which have superseded other things, some of which have been reinstated. There's a, it's difficult to point to the legislative framework as a whole that describes our relationships to the state. <clears throat> Some people have suggested that this is to our advantage because it means that there's no part of the British state that can't be renegotiated and realigned. Other people have said, well, it tends to obscure the individual person's rights and liberties. And I can see both sides of that argument. I'm not going to try and pretend that there's a solution to it here that I can present. Instead, I just need us to be aware that British law comes from a complex and sometimes even contradictory set of sources. So case law, the long-standing precedents of case law, are currently being um, collected and circulated by the Bar Council. Now the Bar Council is the, is the British legal system's bar association. Um, legal systems around the world all have different bar associations, as it's called the, the Bar Council. Uh, but there are historical sources for law as well, because our constitutional law in this country goes back you know, a very long way, more than a thousand years. So, you know, you could people have even cited things like Magna Carta stuff from 800, 900 years ago and said, look, this is relevant in this particular case. So we have to have this awareness that our legal framework is large, some perhaps not entirely obvious, it's a bit obscure. Some people have even said it's perhaps inefficient. Um, besides the kind of historical development of case law, there's also... Um, efforts on the part of the state to correct this. So we have the Law Commission. These guys were set up in the 1960s, aware that there are there's a huge potential for contradiction and obscurity in English case law. So they, their job is to recommend to Parliament ways in which we can make British law uh, fairer, uh, more accessible, simpler, more less opaque, more, more easy to understand. And besides those three sort of uh, formal sources of law, besides the, the development of case law, the, le the law commission making corrections and legislation in the first place from Parliament and, and the Second Chamber. We also have law as derived some of its source from its practitioners, of course. 
So the way they are trained and the way they communicate with one another also influences what British law looks like. So there, there are legal journals, there are textbooks used in the training of lawyers, and encyclopedia used in legal chambers to keep a track of things like specialist terminology or particular forms of practice. And they're all, independently of one another, separate sources of law, and they influence the way in which law is done. Now, besides legislation, we also have regulation. So regulation is supposed to check that the legislation is achieving the intended policy. So if the, if the intended policy is something like greater, less reliance on the state on the part of the individual citizens, and some new new um, legislative instrument comes out that makes it, say, it's supposed to make it harder for individuals to fall back on the state at times of emotional, uh, sorry, times of financial difficulty, you know, restricting the amount of welfare that's available. <clears throat> Regulatory framework is supposed to check that the legal requirements are being met through the delivery of service. So regulation is something like the thing that's carried out uh, by the it's part of the executive branch, but it's a bit like a juridical function, judicial function. It's checking. So in order for the the executive, the, the Department of Health or the Department of Education or the Ministry of Justice, whatever branch of government it is, in order for that thing, the executive, to deliver what it's supposed to deliver according to law, it needs somebody to check that what it's doing is consistent with the requirements of law. And so it creates sort of independent, quasi-autonomous bodies, things in our, in our system, things like Ofsted, the Care Quality Commission and the Care Inspectorate. And, their and there's a bunch of others as well, but their job is basically to check that the policy intentions that have been written into legislation are being delivered through the executive agencies of the state. Now they're supposed to exist in a kind of dynamic equilibrium. So this, the legislation process, tells the regulators what to look for. The regulators inform the legislators about whether or not what's being asked for is being delivered and what changes might be needed. Um, most people would suggest that perhaps there's a kind of imbalance in favour of regulation in our system at the moment, such that because the, the independent agencies, Ofsted, Care Quality Commission, those others, because they, have, uh, they don't have, they're not answerable to an electorate, they have a longer life cycle, they don't, you know, they're not being revised every five years. Because they have that independence, they, they sometimes seem to enjoy a different level of power and authority over the legislature. All right, so that, that's the legislative and regulatory dimension. Now let's have a look at the ethical stuff. So what I want to start with is the idea that the personal isn't the professional. And the, the distinction is you, you don't get people who are good people and turn them into professionals and they're good professionals. It's a big difference between these two. And in terms of ethics, this is my reason for saying so. So personal ethics can be classified normally into one of two basic types. This is something that philosophers tell us. Okay, So you get consequentialist ethics and you get motivist ethics. Sometimes you'll see motivism termed deontology or deontologist. A deon is a duty. So a motive or duty is the, the basis of ethics there. So the consequentialist sees the moral or ethical value of behaviour in terms of consequences. So consequentialists tend to say things like, the ends justifies the means, or we're only interested in maximising the benefits for the majority. See, so the maximum the benefits, benefits are the consequences, the outcomes. Or it might be that we don't think about the majority, we're not democratic consequentialists, maybe we're an elitist consequentialist, and so we're only interested in, in maximising the benefits for the, the deserving group, the, the elite group, or the specific group in society we're interested in. Uh, motivists, on the other hand, tend to say, it doesn't matter what the consequences of your behaviour are, if your behaviour arose from poor motives, it's poor behaviour. If, uh, if your behaviour arose from the, the right motives, or because you were abiding by the rules or the principles, then it can't be bad behaviour, never mind what the consequences are. There's very different ways of thinking. Um, if you ask people who are, by nature, motivist, if you ask dutiful people to behave like consequentialists, it makes them very unhappy. And controversially, if you say the same thing in reverse, it, it's not good for consequentialists to be made to stick blindly to duty either. I try and illustrate what the problem is that this creates, okay? So here's Calvin and Hobbes. <coughs> Calvin has obviously been doing his, his individual inquiry and has settled on the idea that you've got to get what you can while the getting is good. Uh, so <laughs> Mike makes right, winners write the history books, blah, blah. 
It's a dog eat dog world. I'll do whatever I have to and let the others argue about whether it's right or wrong. So he's going for this kind of individual, plucky, consequentialist line of thinking. And Hobbes, taking him at his word, shoves him out of the way. And when Calvin gets upset about it, Hobbes says, well, you were in the way and the ends justify the means. And Calvin's response is, I didn't mean for everyone, you dolt, just for me. In other words, this was his personal ethic. He didn't think at any point that his personal ethic should be applied to everybody else. He wasn't giving advice to everybody else, he was just reflecting on his own personal circumstances. And that's kind of the problem about why the personal and the professional can't be the same. I can't require a whole group of people to stick to a point of view, a moral point of view, that favours one group and causes the other, the other part of the group harm. Let's say that half of the people in our professional group are consequentialist and half of them are motivist. Well, if personal morality is about the limits of conflicts that we can contain, if we're forced to act against our personal morality, so if I take a consequentialist position for the profession, all the motivists in the profession are being put at a disadvantage. And it's a very bad disadvantage to be at because it's bad for your mental health to act outside of your own personal ethic. And the same thing would be true in reverse. <coughs> so for this reason, professional ethics tend to refuse this prioritization of motive over consequence. And they favour instead the development of a set of principles, all of which are supposed to be treated as, on the face of it, equal value. So this on the face of it thing, this is this prima facie or prima facie. That's the idea that no one thing is to be treated, first of all, as more important than any other. You might, when you look at the case in context, change your mind and say, well, actually, this, do this principle does dominate over these others. <coughs> but you can't think that before you get to the specific case. So where personal ethics are protecting a sustainable sense of self, professional ethics are protecting a sustainable sense of community. The public standing of the group in particular has to be protected. You know, in public service, if we don't have the confidence of the general public, we can't serve them at all because they won't, they won't trust us. So our professional ethic is supposed to mean that we are sustainably a community of practice. And that means that some people aren't put at the disadvantage of having to live with other people's morality and that the general public as a whole perceives the profession as trustworthy or reliable. So here are some of the standards that we're required to operate by from one of the two major regulatory bodies for the industry. So this is the Healthcare Professions Council. First thing that they say is you must act to the best interest of service users and you must respect the confidentiality of service users. Mm -hmm. I think straight away you can see why this has to be prima facie, because best interests and confidence aren't necessarily going to be compatible. If a service user or a client turns to a professional and says, I want to tell you something, but you've got to promise to keep it a secret, that's warning bells going off straight away. And the professional has to say something along the lines of, I will do my best to respect your confidence, but if you tell me something that makes me believe that you're, you're in danger, you're at risk of harm, or you're telling me about somebody else who is in danger at risk of harm, then I've got to act on that because I have a, a duty to you as a person and to the community as a whole and to my profession that I am I'm not going to ignore risk of harm when it presents itself to me. So you, you can see you can, you've got to have both on the go at once, but you'll argue one over the other on the individual case. You've got to keep high standards of personal conduct. You've got to provide the regulators with relevant information about your conduct and your competence. We see in public service, you can be wrong, you can make mistakes. What you can't do is cover them up. You've got to be open and honest about them. And that's again about maintaining the tr public trust. You must keep your professional knowledge and skills up to date. You've got to act within the limits of your own knowledge, skills and experience. Don't seek behaviour beyond your competence. If you, do, if you are facing a situation that you can't handle, it's your job, it's your ethical responsibility, your professional responsibility, to refer the matter to the, the appropriate qualified competent agency. You've got to communicate properly and effectively with, with the people you work with. Uh, you've got to effectively supervise tasks that you've handed out to other people. You can't say, well, I, I asked him to do it, he didn't do it, therefore it's not my fault. That's, that's not on. No Nuremberg defence kind of thing here. Uh, you must get informed consent to provide care. I think, again, you can see how this is going to kind of cause contradictions with these basic two here. You know, if I've got to have your informed consent, but I've also got to act in your best interests, if you are not actually capable of giving informed consent because of a mental health problem that you have, you, you know, you've got some advanced paranoid response to people 
in public service, well, how can I then engineer or <laughs> get, get you to consent to something that you don't believe is right for you, which actually objectively we know is what you need? Uh, you've got to keep accurate records. You've got to deal fairly with the risks of infection. Um, this, this gets explicit statement because these are health and care professionals. Um, so it's no good. Um, you, you can't say, well, I didn't talk about the, the, the filthy state of the, the service use as accommodation because I wasn't professionally competent to comment on that. They've got this thing here, you know, like if you're beyond your limits, you refer it to the matter. If you have even the briefest suspicion that there's a risk of communication of disease or infection, it's your job to sort that out in some way, get somebody to deal with it. And you, you, know, you don't get to just say, oh, well, I told the right person if they didn't do it. You've got to supervise that as well. Um, if, you, if your health or uh, mental well-being are such that they are affecting your capacity to do your job, you've got to stop doing your job. You must behave with honesty and integrity. Make sure that your behaviour does not damage the public's confidence in you or your profession. And I think that's, that's critical stuff. There's no point in being a public service if the public don't trust the service. And finally, you must make sure that any advertising you do is accurate. I think some of these things can be seen to flow from others. So this accurate advertising, high standards of personal conduct. Well, if I commission advertising that's dishonest, I must have broken that one first. So I don't think necessarily this is like just a specific instance of some of these others. Um, so the, the business about informed consent and treating people with confidentiality and respect, those two kind of go hand in hand as well, don't they? So some of these things are explicitly stating consequences of ex accepting some of these others. Um, what I like about the HCPC ones is that they're very, each principle is in and of itself fairly straightforward. Now we look at this one here, this is from the other regulatory framework, the College of Social Work. So your first thing you've got to do is protect the rights of of and promote the interests of and then empower people who use social work services. But you've got to do the same thing for the people who care for them. And that's not always going to be a straight deal. It's not always the case that the interests of the, the service user and the interests of their family carer are going to coincide. I think you can fairly easily see where that might not be the case. Apparently you've got to establish and maintain trust and confidence of people who use social work services and their carers and promote independence whilst protecting them as far as possible from unwanted danger. And again, you can see the contradiction between protection and promotion of independence. If I'm genuinely independent, I'm, I'm entitled to take whatever risks I like. You know, you might think it's crazy of me to want to go skydiving, but... If you, if you genuinely want to serve my independence, then you will, you will empower my personal choice. However, if you think that it's crazy of me because, you know, you know that my physical well-being isn't up to skydiving, maybe you... So, in the College of Social Work ones, the contradiction's built in at the level of each principle. So, in a way, you could see each principle here as encapsulating the kind of contradictions that we need to deal with. Third one, respect the rights of people who use social work services and their carers. So a little bit of a contradiction there, the service user and the carer again. And their right to take reasonable risks whilst seeking to ensure that their behaviour does not harm themselves or others. Uh, openly acknowledging that there is a, a tension there between risky behaviours, enabling risky behaviours, and protecting the individual and the public at large. Got to serve and promote the well-being of the whole community. I, that doesn't explicitly contain a contradiction, but I also think that, that might be a bit on the vacuous side anyway. It, it, well-being isn't terribly... Especially the well-being of a community is not an easy concept to operationalise, I don't think. Uh, you've got to promote social justice and display compassion. You've got to respect the individual, presumably, in your professional practice. So there's a contradiction there. It would be compassionate and respectful of the individual who had um, the need... To, for, for the state to install additional uh, lavatories, so downstairs loos or something like that. <laughs> you could see that the individual would then be protected from the need to necessarily protect, you know, continence pads or whatever, which are, are not as dignified as using a toilet. And it would be compassionate for us to do that. But also, where's the social justice? Because we're going to bankrupt the system installing a lot of downstairs loos. So there's a contradiction there as well. We're supposed to uphold the public trust and confidence in social work. I think we've already spoken about that one. I don't think there's any explicit contradiction there. 
got to be accountable for the quality of the work that I do, but I've also got to take responsibility for maintaining and improving my knowledge and skills. I don't think these are in contradiction with one another, but they are very different things. So being accountable for my work and taking responsibility for my development, um, I actually think that, that it's a mark of the professional that they take responsibility for their own development, but it's also a mark of anybody with a contract of employment that they take responsibility for the work that they've been charged to do. Um, I'm supposed to be behaving in a respectful and collaborative way with others <coughs> who share my duties. Um, and I'm also supposed to be promoting the well-being of the people who use social work services. There's a little contradiction there, isn't there, between being um, promoting the well-being of people who share social work, who's, who use the social work services, but also collaborating with other professionals. Well, if those other professionals are, say, the police, and the person who I am working with has committed an offence, am I serving their well-being if I disclose or share information with the police that then puts them at risk of being imprisoned? So that it's not a straight deal. Finally, I'm supposed to support the aims and objectives of the College of Social Work. Now, I don't actually think that that needs to be in this set of principles. I think, as possibly you could say that that's a part of the constitution of the college, that members will all abide by. It's like a democratic principle, isn't it? I'll abide by the, the things the college says, or I'll get out of the college. I don't think that necessarily fits in here with the professional practice. So those are all of the things I wanted to say about this stuff here, about social work practice, legislation, regulation, and ethics. Let's have a look at case studies, though, one well, particular one. So this here is, um, this is Jo. She's a social worker who's new in her post. It's her second job since she's qualified two years ago. So she's, she's off the ASYE, she's been a newly qualified social worker. She's now new in career, you know. So Amy is a senior social worker. Uh, she's also a qualified practice educator and is acting as Joe's mentor. And I mean this in an informal way. She's not. It's not a formal relationship. So she's just there to make sure that Joe has somebody to turn to 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 sort out the office procedures. Um, somebody who can notice if things are going awry or if Joe needs a bit of extra support. But on the um, on the QT, Joe realizes that Amy has an undisclosed family relationship with a client, and she asks Amy if there isn't a conflict of interest here. Now, I don't think every conf every time a person in public service has a relationship to a, a service user that necessarily involves a conflict of interest. Because if you work in the community you live in as a public servant, you are necessarily going to have personal and neighbourly relations with a bunch of the people in that community. But that doesn't mean to say you can't serve that community as well. In fact, I actually think many times we think that teachers and doctors and police officers and social workers who work in the community they live in have a better insight into that community and possibly enjoy the trust of members of that community more readily as well. However, there, there is a problem, isn't there, if, if you do have some undisclosed relationship. So this is what we got. Amy says, the client is the former husband of her sister-in-law. Okay, so he used to be married to her, they split up. She then married Amy's brother. And the, when they split up, it was a, an amicable end of relationship. And that was many years ago, several years ago. So she says, there's no real conflict of interest because it's only kind of tenuous relationship she has to this man anyway. Now, Amy's assessing the man's suitability for unsupervised access to his kids by an unrelated woman, somebody completely different. Um, but he's, she's looking at this in terms of him having a history of substance dependency and other unreliabilities. Should he be left with the kids? question is, <clears throat> is Amy really right, or is she just sweeping stuff under the carpet? Okay, so later on, Joe's thinking about it all, and she says um, she's not convinced, okay? Potential for conflict of interest is still there in her mind, but she doesn't feel it's her place to, to criticise. You know, she's new in post, she's only been in the job for a bit. She's been told to pay attention to Amy because she's a senior prac, she, and she should know what she's doing. You couldn't have some sympathy with Joe's position here, can you? So she wonders whether or not it'd be appropriate to raise the case for discussion and supervision with her line manager, Louisa, but she can't decide whether she should or not. Over the next few days, she's very busy. By the time she has a chance to talk to Louisa about her concerns, she feels it's too late. I think this is a bit disingenuous of Joe. 
I actually think what's happening here is Jo is discomforted by the conflict that she feels about what she knows. She feels that she should be respectful and keep her nose out, but in another way, the client's interests come first. So she does the junior, the rookie mistake. She makes herself busy rather than dealing with the real issue. It's an approach avoidance strategy. She knows that if she does address the issue, she's getting into stuff that's problematic for her, for Amy, for Louisa, for the service. And nobody is going to say, well done, Joe, thank you very much for stirring up all this. But also, if she doesn't do anything about it, she it could come back to bite her, certainly could bump back to bite Amy. And that's, a, that's another thing that she knows as well. So instead of dealing with either of those two unpleasant consequences, those two unpleasant possible outcomes, she hides in a bunch of busy work. Sometime later, it emerges that Amy has made an unfair assessment and the client appeals. When the appeal is heard, the undisclosed relationship becomes apparent and Amy now faces capability and disciplinary procedures. So capability procedures are when we take somebody and say, clearly, you've not been doing your job properly. What do we have to do to make you capable of doing your job? And disciplinary procedures are the punishments that we have to accommodate or have to accept as a consequence of us not doing what we said we would do. All right, so Joe now feels guilty about this, decides to raise her concerns in supervision with Louisa after the fact. So they discuss Joe's feelings and choices and identify the following. First of all, Joe feels guilty because if she'd acted on her concerns, Amy's professional standing might not have been called into question. She'd not now be facing employment and financial insecurity. So on a personal level, Joe feels guilt about the difficulties that Amy is now in. And that's a personal ethical response, guilt. Now this, I think, probably comes more from Louisa. So Joe wasn't clear about her responsibilities to the client. And this is a professional responsibility. And it's harder to see because the client isn't Joe's client, but they're a client of the service that Joe participates in. So the client's children, their mother, and all those other people who were distressed by having the assessment made and then having it appealed and having the undisclosed relationship emerge and all of those other... That was not good for those people. Now, despite Jo's feelings and her wanting to support Amy, it's also going to be inappropriate for her to speak with her about the case because that could prejudice the disciplinary procedures and the capability procedures that are in place. I think from this, what I want to say is, if you look at it carefully, you can see that this feeling guilty is a personal ethical response. And if Jo had had her focus more clearly on her professional responsibilities... She wouldn't now be in the situation she's in. And also, Amy might not be in the situation she's in. And the services standing with the public might not be in the position that it's in. And that's really what I wanted to do, is to illustrate how working out of personal ethical responses is not going to ever serve the interests of the profession. It might make you feeling good, and it might not result in a disaster. But if you don't respond to the professional code but only to the, the personal one, the risk is that you bring the profession into disrepute. That's pretty much all I wanted to say.